So my uh, talk, I'm, uh, I, I assume we're supposed to introduce ourselves. My name's Chuck Samuels, and I'm the medical director of the Center for Sleep and Human Performance in Calgary. And um, I uh, do research with the Olympic teams. Um, our research is funded by Own the Podium, which if you're a Vancouverite, you'd probably know about. And it's the research arm of the Canadian Olympic Committee. And so I'm going to give a, a talk that is pitched at the public level um, to sort of discuss my, um, my, my research, but more importantly, what we do clinically with athletes and sort of the history of how all of that has evolved. Um, I do have disclosures and conflicts of interest. My research developed a screening questionnaire, and we own the uh, copyright to that questionnaire. Um, so I've put in a reference there that justifies its use. Um, I'm on a few advisory boards, and, and the only thing there is I am a consultant for Red Bull, which is quite interesting because I work in their eSport division. So those are ath athletes who uh, do play video games, and they have terrific sleep disturbance. So uh, those are my disclosures. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic sleep science that's irrelevant to athletes. You've probably heard, if you've been here all day, you've heard some of this stuff. More importantly, the role of sleep in recovery, because that's the key point with athletes. We want to recover them better so we can train them harder so they can perform better. So that's the key of this. And then talk about the athlete sleep screening, what its role is in this whole um, uh, domain of interest. And then a little bit about managing sleep in the athletes. And then, of course, I'll leave some time for um, questions. So the basic science is really simple. We have a wake system, and you were just talking about that, because if you're not awake, you're falling asleep, and you can crash a car. So we have a system in our brain that keeps us awake, and it modulates throughout the day. We have a sleep system that puts us to sleep at night. Okay? And we have a circadian system that oscillates wake and sleep. And so these three systems have to work together to get optimum sleep. And that's what this is. It's just a diagram. Um, I don't know if the pointer works. It doesn't, does it? So it's a diagram of how, basically, I use this term, symphony of sleep. All of these things have to fit together. You have to be sleeping at the right time for your brain. So some people are night owls, some people are larks. Most people are neutral sleepers, sort of like 11 to 7 sleepers. But if you're outside that window naturally, or you're sleeping against your clock, so in other words, you're going to bed at 11, and you have to wake up at 5 to get to work because you have a, an hour-long commute, that's against your natural clock. If you're using an alarm clock to wake up every morning, that's against your natural clock. So we have to have all of these pieces of the puzzle, the sleep system, the wake system, and the circadian system aligned to get the optimum out of your sleep because sleep is the foundation of human recovery. So it's where we recover. There are many other things we do to recover when we stress our bodies, but we need sleep to get that baseline, okay? And then within sleep, so that's, those are the systems that keep us awake, put us to sleep, give us the right timing, our zone. But when we're sleeping, our brain cycles through stages of sleep. Most people have heard of this, the stage one, stage two, dream sleep, and deep sleep. You were just talking about deep sleep. Different things occur in different stages of sleep that help us learn, remember, and physically recover. And again, if your sleep systems aren't optimally put together, it disturbs what's going on in your brain and the rest of your body, and you don't get the optimum recovery. Okay. So this is the way we sort of operationalize this when we're talking with support teams. So I am just a tiny part of what's called an integrated support team for each national sport organization. So uh, uh, long track speed skating or cross country or downhill skiing, they all have national sport organizations. And the, it, within those organizations, we have teams of support staff. And sleep is one of them, and we, pro we provide that service to each national team, okay? And we have this diagram that we use, and we talk about the health and wellness of an athlete. We talk about the resilience of an athlete, so they're healthy and they're well, but are they resilient? Can they withstand high stress, either from training? It could be training at altitude. It could be travel. It could be the rigors of their sport, okay? So how resilient are they? And those two things, health, wellness, resilience, 
ultimately converge into their, their final athletic performance. And then, of course, there are many other factors that are individual to each athlete. But when you get to the highest level, at the, at the elite level of sport, all of these athletes are, are, are skilled. They all have the talent, okay? It's a question of these minor little differences, you know? So recovery becomes really important because you can train harder and improve your performance at that very high level. And so in Canada, we have a, 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 a significant commitment to training of athletes through their life cycle, right from five years of age to 90 years, taking, for instance, an Olympic athlete right into their elder years. Sport Canada has invested into a program called the Long-Term Athlete Development Program, and it's online. You can just type into the computer, Long-Term Athlete Development. And for every sport organization in Canada, tennis, basketball, skiing, whatever it is, there is a document produced on how to coach athletes and how to look after athletes, right from when they're little and they're just playing soccer in the field, you know, all the way up to being on the national team. And so it's quite a sophisticated program and we've produced the sleep part of it and I think I have, no, I didn't put it in here, but the sleep document actually has a little sort of graph for parents to look at very simply if my child's 13, what do I have to pay attention to? What do I have to look for? If my kid isn't getting enough sleep or isn't rested enough, isn't like the other kids, what do I have to look for and should I go to the doctor or get some help? So we're trying to raise the awareness of the importance of sleep within the context of training athletes, in, in the bigger context of training athletes. So when we break it down from a sleep perspective for athletes, we look at are you getting enough sleep, which for sure in junior athletes is not happening for a host of reasons. If you're a parent, how many parents in here have junior athletes? Okay, usually the whole room is filled with them. So the fact is that the kids aren't getting enough sleep because they have too many demands. Just very simple. And so that's a big one. The sleep inertia you've talked about, we look at that when we're training athletes. So if they have afternoon naps before an afternoon training session, just like the previous speaker spoke of, you have to be careful about throwing them in the gym and starting to do very complex tasks or, or demanding tasks after a nap. And we strategically have the athletes nap to catch up on their sleep. So the way we do it, it's like math. We say, okay, how many hours of sleep do you need a week? And let's set the bar, the minimum, at seven hours for an athlete who's training at least two hours a day, let's say. Seven hours a night would be the absolute minimum, and that would be a little bit not enough for a teenage athlete. So that's 49 hours a week. Again, not a lot of sleep from our perspective as sleep researchers and sleep clinicians. So we tell them, you've got to shoot for the 50 hours a week. Now, if there's a teenager, it's more to the 60 or 70 hours a week. So we strategically put naps in and help them with weekend sleep, and we work it around their training schedule. We may work with the coaches to change training. Um, and in some countries, Australia being one, they've changed training in some sports to allow athletes to sleep in. We've done that with some of our sports here. Swimming is the worst, where kids have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. At the time in their life when they need the most sleep, they get the least amount of sleep. Okay, so sleep inertia plays a role, sleep deprivation, circadian factors, in other words, the timing of your sleep, and with teenagers, as, a, as an example, they become night owls as teenagers, that's a normal thing, about 20 or 30 percent of teenagers become night owls, it's a totally normal part of adolescence, but that means they have difficulty falling asleep, and of course they have to get up early for school, and that affects their recovery in their training. Some kids are more tolerant than others, but that's actually not the issue. Because even in the kids who are tolerant, could they perform better if we gave them the amount of sleep that they needed is the question. And finally, sleep disorders. So this goes very, it, it's, it's ignored in young people because parents don't think that their kid has a sleep disorder necessarily. But we find that in a lot of children, especially in youth athletes, insomnia is not uncommon, it's, it's common and that can seriously affect their ability to, again, get the rest and the sleep that they need to perform at their best in their sport and at school. So in the management of the athletes, we look at improving the amount of sleep by determining 
how much do you need? So there are ways of doing that. Again, this science is very young and it's not accurate. These are estimates to guide parents and children about what you really should get. Okay? We don't have accurate numbers. Okay? And we can't, there are no tests to determine what's best. We want to know that their sleep quality is good. That's just a very simple question. If you sleep, do you feel rested or do you sleep, feel your sleep is good quality and deep? That's a simple way of asking, and it's very predictive of whether they have a problem. And what about the sleep phase? What's a natural time for you to fall asleep, and do you sleep deeply and then wake up naturally? Of course, the kids don't because they have technology. So technology is our biggest barrier right now, and it's a significant one. And that bleeds into sleep hygiene. What are they doing? How much Coke and um, you know, uh, 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 stimulant drinks, the, the Red Bulls and the, the energy drinks are they drinking? Um, what are they doing before sleep? Are they re resting? There's so many factors here in the behavior they have around sleep okay, that we have to look at. So at the end of the day, what we do with the athletes and the coaches and the support staff is we make it as simple as possible. We get them to focus on determining the athlete's sleep need and then doing the math to figure out that they're getting the amount of sleep they need a week. And we really believe that it is more towards 60 hours a week in most athletes, okay? Determine the optimum sleep phase and try and stick as close as possible as you can to that. Adjust the training around sleep and rest. So that's not that easy because teams, they have practice times. Anyone here who's with a hockey family, you only have ice time when you get ice time. So then we're looking at strategies to sort of survival sleep and survival recovery for the kids. But you can't ignore it. Um, so we use strategic napping to minimize sleep debt. And the most important thing at the end of the day is working with routine. So trying to give the kids a routine that works for them and the parents the understanding that routine is critical. The more random they are, the harder it is to get them the quality sleep they need to perform at their best. And again, that's at any age, not just children. Okay? So recovery is all about rest and rest does not have to be sleep. So we teach them how to meditate. We're, we're big advocates of using meditation and mindfulness to get them to reduce their state of arousal so they can get some recovery just through rest. Napping, as I've said, and then the sleep. You know, we really believe um, that in, in, in high-level athletes at any, at any age, the window is eight to 10 hours that they really should be getting. There are some athletes that do just fine on less than that, but you wanna know that they're fine, and that's the purpose of doing sleep screening. Okay. So you've learned a bit about napping, and I want to give you time to ask questions. So the bottom line is, you know, learn what you need and get it. Um, if your sleep quality is poor, get help. So I always try and get the message out to the public that if a child or anyone is complaining about the quality of their sleep, don't ignore it. Don't go to the pharmacy and get uh, something off the shelf. Um, don't take medical marijuana, please. Um, go and speak to your uh, primary health care provider and get some help, you know. Rest is very important for recovery. It's not all about sleep. Resting is really important and very effective. Just closing your eyes and sitting quietly, meditating, using mindfulness, these things actually work and they work well. And at the end of the day, from my point of view, because we don't want to scare athletes, because it's actually quite easy to do that, um, if you get what you need, it's as good as it gets. That's it. And if you're not performing, it ain't your sleep. Go look for some other reason, okay? And so what I say about determining if they're normal sleepers, because they always want to know this, is if you go to bed and fall asleep within 30 minutes and you sleep through the night, and if you wake up, you fall back to sleep within about 15 or 20 minutes, you wake up spontaneously in the morning without an alarm clock, and within an hour of waking, you feel rested and refreshed and have a reasonably good day, that's normal. You probably don't have a sleep problem, okay? And so we use things like sleep logs and light therapy. These books are um, recommended reading, and I don't know if you have access to the slides, but Take a Nap, Change Your Life is an excellent book that we use for napping. Sink Into Sleep is a Canadian book on um, 
Insomnia and Say Goodnight to Insomnia is written by an American fellow from Harvard. Um, and Judith Davidson is from Queen's University. And these are excellent books for kids or people struggling with insomnia. So in the end, y y the sleep requirements and the potential for disturbance change over time through an athlete's life cycle. So we're always working with them. We're always screening their sleep to see if there's a problem. Establishing a routine and, and establishing the importance of routine is key. And we really in, try and emphasize not to compromise sleep for training. So training on a rested body is sort of the thing that we say to them. We want them to establish the importance of sleep early in their career so they get it and provide time or opportunity for sleep, which is really the problem, and that has a lot to do with technology. And again, to tell them that if they have poor sleep, they should get help. So that's all I have to say, and this is my crew of people that have supported me in the research. And um, I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know how much time there is left.